It's May the 1st, 1943, and 78 B-17s from the 306th Bomb Group are heading over the channel towards France. Their target are the German U-boat pens at Saint-Nazaire. There is heavy cloud cover and the B-17s let loose their bombs. The mission was shaping up as a huge success. The flak was moderate and the German fighters didn't seem to attack with any great determination. The 306th headed home for England. Another mission completed, or so they thought. In a B-17F number 649, on his first mission was ball turret gunner Sergeant Maynard H. Smith. At five foot four inches, Smith was not a tall man, which was an essential requirement for a ball turret gunner. B-17 crews had a mortality rate of 30%, but for ball turret gunners, it was 60%. Although that didn't buy any favors with the rest of the crew. Known to the other crewmen as Snuffy after a grumpy comic strip character named Snuffy Smith, he was not well liked amongst the men. For Smith, the feeling was mutual, who said of the other airmen that they were people that I had no interest in, but was forced to associate with simply because I was in the army. In the early afternoon, the lead navigator of the B-17s took the formation down to around 2,000 feet, or just over 600 meters, over what he thought was the coast of England. But to the surprise of the American planes, lights flash below them, and all of a sudden, they realize that they're under attack. The Germans have let loose with everything they have, anti-aircraft guns, as well as artillery and even small arms fire. It's a disaster, as the B-17s are repeatedly hit. Due to what's thought as a faulty compass, this isn't England, it's occupied France. And now the bombers are directly over the city of Brest, one of the most heavily defended cities in control of the Germans. These are flying fortresses, but even a fortress can only take so much punishment, and it's not long before one of the planes goes down, then another, then another. The B-17s turn, trying to avoid the worst of the fire from the ground and head out over the English Channel. But then, as the anti-aircraft fire trails off into the distance, there was a respite. It was a short one as 20 FW-190s scream in and let loose with machine gun and cannon fire. Crews call out the positions on the intercom as the B-17's machine guns buzz as they take the fight back to the Germans. Smith's plane, number 649, was towards the edge of the formation and was much more vulnerable than the other fortresses. In the ball turret, Smith watched in fear as tracer fire snaked towards him. He heard it hit his B-17 and then an explosion rocked the flying fortress. The intercom system went dead, as well as all power to the ball turret. Smith called out, What the hell happened? What's but no answer on? came. Without power in the turret, he was useless and a sitting duck. Manually, he cranked the ball turret around so as to get into the main plane and managed to get out. But the relief was short-lived. It looked like an inferno. The wing tank had been shot and gasoline pours into the plane. Towards the front of the plane, the way was completely blocked by fire. Also, towards the tail section, there's a raging fire. The oxygen supply had been hit and escaping oxygen fans the fire's flames. With no intercom to the captain and the way blocked by fire, three of the men decide to bail out. The radio operator jumps and the two waste gunners decide they've done enough and they too had to get out. One of the gunners got his parachute strap snagged. Smith stepped forward and shouted, Is it warm enough for you? Screw you, Snuffy. Here, let me help. As Smith helped the gunner free his parachute strap, the gunner didn't see the joke and bailed out. Those three men were never seen again. Smith was small, but he was tough and determined. With the incredible heat of the fire, he wrapped some cloth around his head, grabbed a fire extinguisher, and set to work tackling the flames towards the rear of the plane. Battling against the heat and through the flames, he could make out the tail gunner, Roy Gibson, crawling towards him. Gibson had been badly hit. Giving the man first aid, Smith realized that Gibson's lung had been punctured. In severe pain, 
Gibson weakly asked Smith, uh, Can you see England yet? Smith looked out of the hole in the plane. There was just sea. We're almost home. Grabbing the extinguisher, Smith then went on to tackle the fire at the front of the plane. Eventually, overcome by fumes, he had to rest. Looking out the side of the plane, his blood ran cold. The FW-190s were back to finish the job. Jumping up, Smith manned the waste gun as an FW-190 screamed by on its attack run. Then he jumped over to the other waste gun to pepper the 190 as it sped away. The fire was so intense now, Smith was throwing everything flammable out of the gaping holes in the side of the plane. The Inferno was starting to cook the ammunition in the radio compartment, and Smith even had to throw some ammunition canisters out of the plane. After the fire extinguishers were done, he threw any water he could lay his hands onto over the fire, and even tried to pee on it to help put out the flames. Anything to keep his bird in the air. Smith repeatedly went from administering aid to the injured, fighting the fire, and all the while fighting off the enemies with the waste guns any one of which was a massive trial, but Smith managed all three. Just after 3 p.m., the B-17 crossed the English coast. Smith sat exhausted, his clothes smoldering, the compartment completely gutted, the gun mount and camera were mounted, but all the fires were out. For the pilot, Lieutenant Lewis P. Johnson Jr., this was his 25th mission. He said, this is a hell of a way to finish. Seven planes were lost on that day, along with the lives of many young men. All seven crew that stayed on board 649, including Gibson, survived. Incredibly, Smith's actions saved the plane and the lives of the young men on board. As the medics pulled Gibson off the plane, he jokingly requested he be given his purple heart. Smith said the plane was riddled with about 3,500 bullet holes. It was all burned out in the center. There was nothing but the four main beams holding it together. 10 minutes after it landed, the plane collapsed. For his actions, Smith was awarded the Medal of Honor. But Smith's troubles and irreverence to authority continued. That week, after he was awarded the Medal of Honor, he was assigned to kitchen duty as punishment for arriving late to a briefing. He continued in combat, but was grounded due to combat stress reaction, or PTSD as it's known today. In an unprecedented move against a Medal of Honor recipient, Major Thomas F. Witt, the 306th operations officer, pushed for Smith to be demoted to a private for poor job performance. Witt said that repeated warnings and reprimands have been a necessity to get Smith to work at all. On December the 17th, 1944, Smith was demoted. Characteristically, he said of the events, it was the rotten deal that lousy outfit gave me via the great judgment of Witt and some of his cohorts. He was sent home shortly after. He'd always said to his friend he wouldn't return home unless they threw a parade for him. And to his surprise and delight, that's exactly what happened to this hero when he returned to his hometown. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to the channel and please watch more videos of ours. Thank you.